Oh, I see it now. Also, it also says live. It shows on 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 Zoom that it's live. Yeah, yeah. So but when I look there? on Facebook, I'm not so seeing it's not live us on yet. Facebook. I don't see it yet. I don't know. Okay. Oh, there we go. Yeah, there we go. There we go. So we live. Us. Okay. Right. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us here this evening. Uh, this is again our norm, uh, the Sabbath school lesson study. Uh, every Sunday evening, starting from seven. We apologize for being slightly late, but we had some technical issues. Uh, in other words, we had some slow Wi-Fi from our side over here. But having said that, welcome everyone. I'd like to read the opening verse here this evening, which is found mm -hmm. in Second Corinthians chapter four, verse six. It says, "For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shone." in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Uh, this lesson study, lesson number five is entitled, Jesus as the master teacher. Jesus as the master teacher. Can we close our eyes for opening prayer? Let's pray. A wonderful heavenly father, Lord, we come here this evening with grateful hearts, knowing that you were with us throughout this course of the day. Lord, as you're about to open up your lesson study, your word, may you be with us in a very, very special way. I pray that you be with those that are watching from near and from far. That you open their hearts, open their minds, and as we taste and see that you are good, may we share to those that are in need. Forgive us from our sins. Bless us now, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> this evening, I am very, very grateful to have uh, uh, two of the most powerful uh, panelists yeah. you can find in Cape Town when it comes oh, to the Sabbath School lesson study. And here yeah. this evening, we have a debut, um, as we call it in football, made by Pastor Ivan Hoodman. Having said that, I'm going to ask um, Tyron to introduce himself, give a small background, and then to our debutant here this evening, mm -hmm. Pastor Ivan Hoodman, to do the same. Over to you. Thanks, Manny. Uh, happy Sunday, everyone. Um, it's once again, it's a privilege uh, to join, join you guys and uh, to share God's word. So um, I'm Tyron, um, married to one wife. And um, <laughs> um, so I wasn't always Adventist, you know, I was born New Apostolic, Pentecostal. Um, and now I'm Seventh-day Adventist. And so I praise the Lord for his guidance and his, his grace and I pray that you will enjoy each each minute as we share God's word. Thank you. Amen. 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 Um, I'm Ivan Woodman. I completed my studies at Helderberg College in 2018. And since then, I've spent some time teaching both in our church facility and for the government in part. Um, and currently, um, being under lockdown, I spend my time um, doing virtual meetings with our churches and seeing where I can assist our pastors in these regions. Um, I have a passion for helping people, everyday people, understand and Amen. make the word of God practical in our everyday lives. And so if we can do that, I believe that there's lots that we can overcome and there's a great understanding of God that we can have and what he wants us to accomplish in our lives. Thank you so much for that, Pastor, for a beautiful introduction. So, yeah, it's a debut of Pastor. You will see him quite regularly. Um, um, uh, people ask me, I've, I, I've never given a, a short introduction of myself, but I always say I'm Manfred Otzenberg, known as Uncle Manny, and I'm a follower of Christ. And that's the most important title that you can have. So for those that just joined, that joined us now, good evening and welcome. We're busy with lesson number five, uh, which is entitled... Um, Jesus, the master teacher. I'll quickly touch on on Sabbath. And the lesson study starts also beautifully with a story that mentioned um, of Billy Graham. Uh, Billy Graham witnessed one day that he was, uh, that a, a doctor whispered in his ear while there was a soldier that was wounded uh, laying in, 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 a, in a bit of a mechanism, but his face was down. Uh, the doctor whispered in his ear and said that, uh, I don't think this soldier will be able to walk. Then all of a sudden the soldier asked and said, hey, doctor, can I see your face please? Because I went to war for you. 
the doctor then went down on his on his knees or I can just imagine going going down looking up at the soldier and all of a sudden Billy Graham said that he saw tear fall on the face or on the cheek of the doctor that came from the soldier the reality is that at the time of Jesus birth humanity lay mangled and bleeding in need of a healing vision of God I want to read 2 Corinthians 4 verse 6 that says or that touches on the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ it is though humankind pleaded oh God could we see your face? His son, in sending his son to this planet, the father sent the master teacher on a mission to show mankind his face. Isn't it beautiful to know that God sent his son to us to see his character and a revelation of him. Sunday speaks about revealing the father and the New Testament authors uh, repeat significantly the idea that Jesus comes to earth to human beings to show who the Father is. In past time, God's revelation came in a fragmented way through the prophets, as we know, or as we hear in Hebrews chapter 1, verse, verse 1 to verse 4. I'd like to read it in your hearing. The Bible says, In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in verse 2, it says, But in these last days, He has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he made the universe. Listen to this. The son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. Verse 4 says, so he became as much superior to the angels as the name he was inherited is superior to theirs. In the past, like I've mentioned, uh, God's revelation came in a fragmented way. And God had to send Jesus to give a reflection of God's glory, as Hebrew 1 verse 3 says. I also want to highlight that there's a word or term used in the Greek that refers to character which is sometimes used for the impression, a seal made in wax for the representation of a coin. And here the scholars and indicates that Jesus is the exact imprint of God's very being. If we wish to know the Father, we must listen carefully to what the Master teaches us and say about him. And we must watch the Master teacher as well. The Father is seen in the Son. St. Corinthians 4, verse 4, tells us that the image of God, Jesus, is brought to knowledge about God the Father. That is touching on Sunday, which is entitled, The Revealing the Father. I'm going to go and ask my, my fellow panelist, uh, Tyrant Prince, TP as we call him, to touch for us on Monday, which is also entitled, the same title as Sunday, Revealing the Father, Part 2. Over to you, Tyler. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Manny. Um, so this is a very interesting lesson study. And uh, as Manny was talking about, you know, I'm touching on, on Monday, re Revealing the Father. Um, just a thought that came to my mind, you know, it's very interesting. When you look at Jesus coming to this world and dying, we are told in spirit of prophecy that if the Father came down, his life would have been exact like Jesus. Exactly, he would have lived. He would have done everything Jesus done, the Father would have done. That's amazing, the thought of the Father and the Son working together. So I just want to touch on John chapter 14 and verse 29. And this is a profound verse. The Bible says, and now I have told you before it come to pass, that when it comes to pass, you might believe. You know, the Bible is a very powerful book. In fact, when you look at the gospel, the gospel means uh, good news, but the gospel is also there to bring an end to suffering and pain. And that's why the gospel is so powerful, because the gospel came, came in our hearts, and it, it came in our hearts to show us exactly who God is and what God is going to uh, do at the end of time. So 
When you look at the Gospels, what is interesting when I look at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John's Gospel is very interesting that they all come to the same conclusion. In fact, when you when you read the, the Gospel of, of Matthew, you will understand that he presents Jesus as the heir of David, the fulfillment of God's promises to, to Abram. He is the true king, and he has come to fulfill the law and the prophets. In Mark's Gospel, Jesus as the Son of God comes with authority to teach, heal, and cast out demons. He's also the Son of Man. In Luke's Gospel, Mr. Healer is a friend to the tax collectors. He has come to save the lost and the outcast. But I want to touch a little bit on John's Gospel because it's very interesting when we look at John's Gospel. He speaks about Jesus and his divinity. Jesus, the word made flesh, and he's the son of God. Now, what is interesting in, in his gospel is that when you look in John chapter 1, verse 14, the Bible says, and the word became flesh, it God becoming a human. But we cannot comprehend how is it that God, the God of the, the universe, can become a man. And the scriptures reveal this to us to understand who the father is. And we can only understand God, the father, is through his son, as many was touching on. In fact, I want to show you something that I just found out today. And I was excited to share this because I saw when we study the Bible, we need to see Jesus in every story. Jesus is the center of, of the Bible. In fact, let me just give you a couple of um, <clears throat> things that I got excited about. Maybe you guys know about it, but I want to show you something that when I was going this afternoon through it, it really... Uh, it just got me and it just warmed my heart. And I could, you can actually see Jesus in this verses in, in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 3. We see that God creates light. And we are told that Jesus is the light of the world. In day 2, the Bible says God created water. Jesus says, I'm the living waters. That's day 2. In day 3, <clears throat> God created the fruit. And Jesus was the first fruit. In day 4, the Bible says God created the greater light and the lesser light, and Jesus is our righteousness. In day five, the Bible says that God created fish. What did Jesus say? I'm the fish of men. In day six, the Bible says God said, let us make man in our image. Who is the express image of, of God? It's the sun. When you look at day seven, the Bible says God rested. But when you look in Matthew chapter 11, 28, Jesus says, come unto me, all ye that are lab who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. We can see Jesus right through the scriptures, right in Genesis. It is very profound. In fact, let me just touch on the last part before I hand over to Pastor. When we look at Jesus and some people say, and this is always a, con it's always a challenge or we debate over Jesus. Is he divine? Is he, is he the son of God? And I, I, I saw people losing debates and, 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 and people was confused on this topic. Is Jesus equal with God? And I just want to share this one verse with you. In the book of Hebrews, the Bible says, it is not possible for bulls and goat to take away sin. But when I look at that verse, the question is, what is Paul actually saying? Why is it can a bull and a goat can't it take away sin? But then you have to ask yourself, a bull and a goat is created. That's why the Bible says it cannot take away sins. A created being cannot die for you. It's only God, meaning Jesus is the son of God. And this is why it's for me, it's very important to understand Jesus and his life and who we claim to be. In other, in other words, when you go to uh, Tuesday's lesson, Paul was trying to communicate to the Christians about who, what Jesus was in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5, when it talks about, um, Jesus be, being equal with God. But that verse, when it speaks about confessing, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess what it, what Paul is saying, it's not exactly at that time or even in our time that every tongue will confess and every knee will bow. It is actually at the time when Christ comes that this prophecy will be fulfilled, that every tongue will confess. In other words, not everybody is going to confess right now that Jesus is Lord. But it's actually at the end of time when people are going to confess 
even though they didn't accept Jesus, by the end of time, they will confess that Jesus is actually the king. He's the, the Lord of lords. And I pray that all of us here will accept Jesus. You know, um, over this week, week and I heard this verse a lot. Not everybody that says, Lord, Lord, <laughs> mercy. But may we have Jesus in our hearts. May, may we love for him every day because he loved for us. And I just want to leave you with this thought, this thought. Jesus came to this world not only to die for us, but it was actually to reveal God, his father, to the universe. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brother TP, you, for that, Peter. for going through Monday and Tuesday for us. Uh, uh, Tuesday was entitled Reading the Master's Teacher's Mind. We're going to go now to Pastor Ivan Woodman, and he'll touch for us on Wednesday, which is entitled The Master Teaching the Recon Reconciliation, and also on Thursday, which is entitled The Master's Teacher's First Pupils, and also on Friday. Over to you, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you. So when we look at Wednesday, Wednesday takes over um, this idea of Jesus Christ as the master teacher. And we need to take all of this in the context of the lesson for this quarter, and that is education. We're looking at being truly educated and, and given a, a holistic education as Seventh-day Adventist Christians. And so here we are told who the master teacher is on Tuesday already. And so now we look at the same master teacher, but we look at him from the perspective of reconciliation. And it's the lesson on, on, on Wednesday starts out by speaking about human relations. You know, if we look around us, um, relationships are often strained, um, be it in marriages. In fact, if we look at the world around us today, a lot of couples don't even make it to marriage because things just tend to fall apart. If we look at friendships, we see people are friends one day and then the next, they're not talking to each other. And, and so we see this this issue within the human race of distrust and of broken relationships. Um, but broken relationships can be mended. And this, when this happens, when, when, when a broken relationship is mended, this is what we call reconciliation, the coming together of something that, or two people or a group that was once separated. And so this is the, 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 the topic for Wednesday. And we start out with a question. And the question is, how does reconciliation lie at the heart of Christ's incarnation and his role as master teacher? So how does this reconciliation link up with who Jesus Christ is, how, who God the Son in human flesh is, and is a role teaching us and being our master teacher? And, and the answer, we are told, comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16 to 21, and, and I'm not going to read the entire thing, but we see the answer in specific verses. The end of verse 18 speaks about it a little bit, and then verse 19 really answers the question, if I can read that for you. It says, that is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself. So, by Christ just being Jesus Christ, being our Savior, and coming to this earth, just in that existence, He's reconciling us to God. And, and then it, it gives us a bigger picture and it paints it further in verse 21. Verse 21 really puts, it puts this picture in perspective. It says, for our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And so here we are told that Jesus Christ goal, that Jesus Christ's aim on this earth, that his mission on this earth was one of reconciliation, and that in order to reconcile us with God, he had to take on, he who knew no sin, we are told, had to take on our sin so that we can be reconciled with God the Father. And so, um, we are told in the lesson that when we have this argument, this fight, this break up in relationships, in friendships, we feel blessed and we feel overjoyed when there's reconciliation between you and a friend. So how much more so when you are reconciled with God? How much more joy should you feel with the fact that Jesus Christ came to reconcile you to God? But it doesn't just stop there. You see, um, 
the, 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 I want to read a small section. It says, again, though we are not simply to be consumers of the joys of reconciliation, we are not called to just, to just take in this issue, in this topic of reconciliation. It says we are to learn from the master teacher. We are, we are invited to participate in reconciliation. And so, yeah, as I think about this, and as we link it back first, before we go into this, this topic of participating, if we link it back, um, reconciliation, we were told that Jesus Christ, at the start of this lesson, we were told that Jesus Christ teaches us who God is. And through reconciliation, Jesus teaches us that God is love, that God wants to reconcile with you, that he wants to put aside the differences, that he's willing to send his own son to, to die for us, to take on sin for us. He's willing to show love in that way so that we can be reconciled to him. And I think about this part where we are called at the end of Wednesday to be part. We are called, we are invited to, to partake. And how do you partake in reconciliation? And I think about my time teaching. I, I spent time teaching computer applications, and and I, I noticed it then, but it happens with children everywhere. Um, when you teach a child something, and the child sees someone else struggling with the same thing, the child is the first one to go and help. The child might not be the master of that subject, but because they've learned that specific thing that you've taught them, they rush over to go and help the next child. And so they become a participant in the education of others. And so in the same way, as we are reconciled to God, we are then included. We are, we, we are meant to participate in the reconciliation of ourselves to others, but also in the reconciliation of others to God, of leading others to that same point that Jesus Christ took us to, to reconcile to God. And then as we go to Thursday, Thursday speaks about the master teacher's first pupils. And when I looked at this, the first thing that comes came to my mind and maybe comes to yours is the disciples. But this is not the disciples, in fact. If we look, Luke chapter 2, verse 8 to 20 shows us who these first pupils are. It's, it speaks about how the Lord um, sends angels to appear to these shepherds. And these, these shepherds receive this message, fear not, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. And here we, we see this message of reconciliation, this message that, that the reconciler has come, coming to these shepherds. And so we are told on Thursday that the first students of our master teacher were Mary, Joseph, and these shepherds. And as we, we see their interaction, we are told that we too are, are called to worship and are called to, to, to glorify this master teacher before he even teaches us anything from his birth. And, and then we are taken to a question, a question in the middle of Thursday that says, how do the wise men, because the wise men are the next um, are the next students. How do the wise men respond to the news of the birth of Jesus? And how does Herod respond? And I love this section um, closing off Thursday uh, for us. We see two people or two groups, Herod and the three wise men. They both receive a lesson from the master teacher. They both receive the same lesson, so to speak. They both receive the same message at around about the same time. But there's a big difference. The first one is that the wise men are watching and studying and waiting before the time, whereas Herod isn't. But then when Herod is told of this Savior, this, this Messiah that has been born, we see a great difference. Verse 10 tells us that when the wise men saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. But further down, we are told that Herod, when hearing about this, plots to kill Jesus. And so, yeah, we see two different responses. And I think back to being in a classroom. You see, maybe you can place yourself back in your classroom. We receive a lesson from our teacher. And not everyone receives the lesson the same way. There are those students who take that lesson, who understand it, who learn it, who study it, who apply it to, 
what's being taught at the time. And then we, then we have others who sit at the back of the class, maybe who pay no attention, who block it out. When the end, when the end comes and it's time for exams, which is the student that struggles? It's the student who paid no attention to the lesson. And so yeah, when Jesus Christ is our master teacher, we are called to pay attention to the lesson. Um, and so, yeah, we, we see these, this, this, these two groups highlighted at the end of Thursday, this group that can be represented by Herod and this group that can be represented by the three wise men and the joy that we should have when hearing the news that Jesus Christ has come to reconcile us. And now we go over to Friday and Friday um, uses a bunch of quotes just to tie everything off nicely. And I'm not going to read all of them, but I'm going to encourage you to read them. Instead, I'm going to read the middle quote if you are looking at your lesson book and just speak very briefly about, about it. It's the longest of the quotes, the middle one. It says, in the presence of such a teacher, of such opportunity for divine education, what worse folly is it to seek an education apart from him, to seek to be wise apart from wisdom, to seek to be true while rejecting truth, to seek illumination apart from the light and existence without life, to turn from the fountain of living waters and you out broken cisterns that hold no water. Then it ends with the verse. It says, behold, he is inviting. If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of him shall flow rivers of living water. The water that I give him shall become a, in him a well of water springing up into eternal life. And I just, I love that quote and the verse that ties in with it. And it's so true. How can we seek an education away from the master teacher? How can we seek an education in life? You know, we live in a world where education is put on a pedestal, in a world where, um, where you go nowhere without qualification and education, and you're told to study and study. And, you know, as, you, as matric start getting closer to, to their finals and completing, they, they start, people start asking the question, what are you going to study? You know, no one asks anymore what are you going to do? It's now, what are you going to study? You know, And so in this world where education is so important, we need to be learning first from the master teacher. I think of a little example to close off um, Friday. When, uh, when, when we look at an obstacle course, if I am standing in front of an obstacle course, ready to run a race through an obstacle course, and you blindfold me, I am most likely going to stumble my way through that obstacle course and probably injure myself on that obstacle course. I'm sure you'll agree. Now, if you put me and let's say Brother Manfred in that obstacle course together and I decide to rush ahead and Brother Manfred is behind me, Brother Manfred will hear where I stumble and fall. He will be aware that there are obstacles ahead of him. He'll be more cautious and careful, but chances are even being cautious and careful, I'm blindfolded and so is he. He'll probably stumble along the way too. But you see, if we are blindfolded in that obstacle course and we are given a guide, we are given the master of the obstacle course, the man who designed the obstacle course, who can see, and we follow him, chances are that obstacle course will be a breeze because he knows every step of the way, even though we can't see. And so in the same way, if we are going to navigate our way through life, we need to be following the author of life. If we are going to navigate our way through life, we need to be following that master teacher, Jesus Christ, or else we are just going to stumble our way through life. We are given a guide. We need to put our hand on his shoulder and allow him to lead us through. I'm going to give over to Brother Manfred again. Thank you so much, Pastor, for that a beautiful explanation um, and rendition of Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. I would like to ask a few questions to you, yourself, Pastor and Brother Brother TP. My first question goes as follows, um, and it's open for both of you to answer or um, either one. The question goes as follows, and it says, what values and actions would be important to Christian teachers and students who take seriously the idea of learning from the incarnation of the master teacher? What values and actions? would be important to Christian teachers 
and students who take seriously the idea of learning from the incarnation of the master teach over to you panel pastor can answer that <laughs> i think when we're looking at at values and actions it was something that i left out of my um of my my little summary um jesus christ himself said that he looks at the children when speaking to his disciples and he says unless you become like one of these you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven and so unless we become like a child and we look at the values and the characteristics of a child and we look at the values and characteristics that jesus christ had while on earth and as we merge those two we see what we are to be like because a child is teachable a child is impressionable and as we come and sit before the master teacher we need to come with that attitude one that is teachable one that is moldable um brother manfred you spoke at the start about the greek word for character being um a an image that is used of an impression of a signet ring and how the wax takes on an identical impression of what that signet ring is and so that's that that's that's that that's the picture that's given and so if that's the picture that's given then we need to be like that wax we need to be moldable by the master teacher by that signet ring and so as i think about that i think about jesus christ saying we need to be like a child and that child is like that wax it's moldable we can we can move it around and it takes on the the image that is pressed into it thank you so much for that illustration it's a, many this is a thought that came to my mind now um mm -hmm. you know there's a uh, that was very um, very powerful the past of the demonstration uh, but there's a thought that just came to my mind of, um, you know, Ellen White. I don't know if you can remember the quote, but she says, higher than the higher, highest human thought can reach. Anybody, can you finish it? Higher than the highest human thought can reach is God's ideal for God's his children. Ideal. Yes. For his children, godliness, godlikeness. Yes. So it's, it's exactly what you just said, and I think it's linked with that. That God wants us to to love a a a Christ a Christ like life. Thank you for that, uh, brother T. Brother T, I got a question for you. Then I'd like Pastor also to touch on that, yeah, because you're not going to run away from questions here this evening. <laughs> <laughs> the question goes as follows: Christian parents and teachers have a high standard to reflect the character of God, as revealed in the incarnation of Jesus. What should we do when we fall short of that high standard? What should we do when we fall short of that high standard? Over to you, TP, and then Pastor can answer. <clears throat> so is this now to you, you asking the question with our, obviously with the parents when they fall short? I just want to make sure I'm I'm on the right page. Uh, Christian parents and teachers, yes. Yeah. Okay, when they fall short, you know that's that's a tough one, eh? um because you i mean you can't pull it back if you if you already done the mistake you know it's always tough um i think you know that the challenge is always with especially in the in our church with with young 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 people or christians always looking at the at the teachers or they're looking at their parents and they always adapt that 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 lifestyle and that and so i think when it comes to parents falling short um for me they need to obviously, if if they if they if the Holy Spirit convicts them and they fall short of God's standard, um, they definitely need to repent immediately, <laughs> right on the spot. They need to confess to God. That's the first thing, and they they must communicate to the to the children definitely that um, they maybe need to apologize that they were they were out of order, <laughs> um, and that um, you know that they 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 obviously. That Christ is still there. That's that's our hope. When we fall short, even when we see people looking at us and we fell short, um, our confidence is not in in man. Our confidence in Christ is always there to forgive us. So, I'll say that parents should first go to God, yeah, and then maybe just confess and then go to the children and then, yeah. Over to you, Pastor. Um, sorry, I was just making sure I don't forget what I want to say. Um, <laughs> we must remember that parents and teachers and anyone in authority is actually a teacher an educator who's under the master teacher mm. and so we learn from the master teacher but we are meant to teach others now 
as far as uh, falling short, the Bible tells us all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And so we are bound to fall short. It is inevitable because we we sinful human beings. Um, yeah. So we're going to fall short. But two weeks ago, our lesson was on the law. And the law shows us that's how we know. How would we know if we fall short if, if the law wasn't there? But the law also mm. points us to grace, right? Mm. That's what, that's what we learned two weeks ago. And so as we fall short, which we will, parents, teachers, anyone in authority will fall short. We need to rely on that grace. But then a verse that speaks about reconciliation says this. It says, come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Right? Mm -hmm. It says, though your sins are scarlet, I will make them as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they will be like wool. And, and yeah, um, uh, Jesus uh, uh, offers this thing, the, this, this reconciliation is extended to us, this come let's reason together, you've fallen short, you meant to be this image, this white as snow image, but you're not, but as you come to Jesus, this reconciliation happens and, and we are allowed to to be made right with him, but this is where the education part is, it comes in, because when we fall short, um, and we, we should be using it, especially as parents, teachers, and others in, in authority, we should be using it as a point to educate those who are listening to us, to educate those who are following us, that I fall short just like you fall short, and to show them that this is where I go when I fall short. This is how I act. This is how mm -hmm. I reconcile with God. This is how I reconcile with those who I've possibly harmed when I've fallen short. And this now... Uh, this now passes that lesson on to others and so we we develop a culture of reconciliation and and i believe that i'm stealing an answer because that answers the question that i think was asked on wednesday how can we um reflect god's role as reconcile and where can we reconcile um where we find ourselves Thank you so much for that, Pastor and Brother TP. I think it's important, like you, if you've mentioned, uh, Pastor. First thing is admission here. Yeah. And I think that is sometimes the most difficult thing to admit, hey, I made a mistake, I was wrong. And uh, that's the first step in, 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 in any process. Even those that are addicts in whatever it might be, the first thing is admission. Yeah. So thank you so much for that. i got another question for you. And I want to pause to... Uh, yes, Pastor. Yeah. Um, just a quick thing, um, an, an old, I haven't asked permission, so I'm not going to mention who, but an, uh, an older friend um, helped me with this once. Um, I was wrong in a, in a situation that we, we dealt with. And so he said, now what is wrong with saying you were wrong? And so now eventually, very reluctantly, I, I now admitted to being wrong. And he stopped and paused for a minute and he said, now what happened? Did something go wrong um, with you did you fall down and die you were wrong before you admitted you were wrong the only thing that's happened now is you've opened yourself up for reconciliation and so when we are wrong there's there's nothing um that we lose by admitting that we were wrong it opens us up for reconciliation um we already were wrong before we admitted it but now we are open we open ourselves up to reconciliation and to god's grace thank you so much for that pastor um, um, I'm glad that you admitted to that and you had some guidance from, from, from a senior, senior figure in your life. Question number, or the third question, rather, goes as follows. It's discussed the question at the end of Thursday's study. What does the birth, life, and death of Jesus teach us about the character of God? And why should this be so comforting to us, especially during times of great trial? Uh, uh, let me repeat that question. What does the birth, life, and death of Jesus teach us about the character of God? Hey, this is a beautiful question, man. I can't wait for the answers. Why should this be so comforting to us, especially during time of great trial? Over to you, Pastor, then Brother TP. Yeah, as far as the character of, of, of God is concerned, um, from birth already, like we said when we were studying Wednesday's lesson, from birth already, Jesus comes with this mission of reconciliation, number one. And so this teaches us um, that God is a God who wants to reconcile to us. And so as we study Jesus' life, Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And so as we study Jesus' life and we see who he is, every single part, I think, um, uh, Brother Tyron mentioned how uh, a quote from Ellen White, and I'm not going to recall it now because I'm 
my memory is going to fail me, but about God um, and Jesus being so closely linked that God wouldn't have done, God the Father wouldn't have done anything differently. He wouldn't have changed the way Jesus was when he came to this earth. And so as we see Jesus' character, um, we see who God is. And as far as um, why this is good news, we can spend, we'll go over time talking about this. Um, but as we look at it, number one, Jesus Christ coming to this earth brings us salvation. Um, and so the fact that God made flesh, Jesus, God the Son incarnate, comes here and, and dies for us means that we have salvation. But it also means that the life giver is teaching us practically by living out. The life giver teaches us practically how to live life. And so, like, like I said uh, earlier, we have this guide now because Jesus Christ came. So we don't have to wander through life aimlessly. We have direction and we have a guide <coughs> to lead them. Thank you so much, Pastor. Brother Tyrant, talk to me, brother. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, there's a there's a, a statement that came to my mind of, of Spirit of Prophecy that says that across we are signs and song. And, and when I look at that, it's just amazing, amazing to know that there's a God in the universe that loves us so much that we will have to study forever and ever and ever the character of God and understand that Jesus actually died. And, and, and one verse comes to me to understand God's the love. Uh, it's in actually in the book of uh, Isaiah chapter 52 and verse 59, verse 2. And the Bible says, it's but your iniquities that have separated you from your God and your sins. So here we see clearly that it was sin and iniqui iniquity that separates us from God. But God loves us so much. You know, it's amazing that, like Manny said, we it's this is a really a, an amazing question. And like you just said, Pastor, you know, We'll never under, really understand God's love, but what I take out of it when I look at the cross, we can really see, then that's the only way we can see God's love. You know, when I go on the trains, I always tell people, you know, the only way you're going to understand that God loves you so much, it is when you look at the cross. Because the angels and the other beings and even humanity will really understand that Jesus loves us so much that he was willing to die for us. In fact, if I can put it in this way, maybe I must repent, but I don't think I need to repent because what I'm going to say is so true. Is <laughs> Jesus was willing to die for us. He was willing to give up his existence just to save us. So I took a bold, state, uh, <laughs> a bold statement to, to say that. So forgive I, me, I said anything wrong. <laughs> no, but I he was willing to, to give up yeah, his existence for us. I think it's so true. I think it's something that that we, I don't know, it's like we don't grasp it fully, you know. Um, yeah. It's our minds, and this is why, um, why I believe Jesus had to come, because our minds can't fully grasp who yeah. God is, you know. And as we see Jesus coming to earth as a human being in human flesh, this we need to remember this is God the Son. Now, if we remember our doctrine as Seventh Adventists, uh, we, we believe in one God, correct? So we're going to try and Amen. break this down as simply as possible. We will believe in one God. God the Father, God the Son, God the, uh, the Holy Spirit. Three co-eternal beings no? mm. that are one being, right? So if Jesus Christ, if God the Son comes to die for our sin, then who is it that dies for your sin and mine? Mm. If God dies for your sin and mine. And so, yeah, you, we can't wrap our heads around it enough, you know, but we see God's love in the fact that the, the, the being who has the power to speak into existence every single thing in the universe comes to die Amen. because he loves Amen. his creation. And so this Amen. gives us a small um, and, and almost imperfect explanation of the grand and great love of God for us. Mm. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for you know you, uh, <laughs> Yes. Mercy. No, man. It's just something I just maybe pastor or, or maybe you can because I know you love this this uh topic that I'm gonna ask many, but it's just uh, maybe just one minute you can answer. It's just something that that I've been struggling with when Jesus was hanging on the cross and he says, My God, my God, 
Is there any reason why I said it twice? He says, my God, my God. I, I, I've read it and I've thought it for myself, but I, I don't want to, to say something that I haven't studied and looked at okay. in, in particular. So, so I'm not sure why. Um, I, 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 I don't know. I can't answer. Could that. it be that he's maybe calling to his father and the Holy Spirit? Just a, it's, a thought? It, it could be. I mean, it's a possibility. I, I, I don't know. Um, mm. As far as I'm aware and the little that I, that I do know, the language doesn't show two different, yeah. you know, um, got, like two distinctions that we can point out. So we can't, okay. I can't say for sure. Um, mm. But I mean, it, it, uh, for all I know, it is a possibility. Okay, thanks, Pastor. Um, thank you so much for that, Tyron. I thought I'm the one asking <laughs> questions. <laughs> but thank you so much for that for a question. But we will get back to you with, with that. Chat. I think that's a very interesting uh, uh, um, 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 idea that you came up with while reading that. Chat. You know, when you were talking about the love of God, there's many things you can say. And you've, and, and, and Pastor and yourself said it so beautifully. But there's a song that just came to mind. And before we came live, I just listened to it. And the lyrics goes, the lyrics goes as follows. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, he chased me down. Fights mm. till I'm found. Leaves the 99. I could have earned. I couldn't have earned it. I don't deserve it. Still, you give yourself away. Oh, the mm. overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Man, the love of God is reckless. And he loves us so much. I got another question here, over here. But before I do that, I also want to read another verse that touches on that about, about Jesus reflecting God and uh, 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 a verse that, that, that we can add to that is uh, Hebrews uh, mm -hmm. chapter 4 verse 14 that says, since we have no high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus the Son of God, let us come hold firmly to the faith we profess for we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are yet without sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in a time of need. I've got a final question here this evening, and it's been very exciting for me to, to, to be with, with, with you this evening. The question is, what situation are you facing? And I think the, the verse links very beautifully with this, with this uh, uh, question, even now in which you're humbling in which you're humbling yourself could give you a powerful opportunity to reflect Christ to others. This is Tuesday's question. What situation are you facing even now in which you're humbling yourself could give you a powerful opportunity to reflect Christ to others? Over to you, Brother TP. And then if possible, want to comment, feel free to do so. Okay, thanks, Manny. Um, you know, this uh, question is, uh, for me, it's a little bit tricky, but when I look with when when you when I listen to the question, it's very interesting. Um, I will go. I will actually go to my workplace. <laughs> the reason why I go to my workplace is because it's very secular where I work. Um, I'm in a call center, so the reason why I'm bringing this is because I can I can guarantee you, Pastor, and to Manfred, that most of the time when you guys find yourself at church, then it's more easier to live the Christian life, isn't it? But when you find yourself around people that is secular and people that don't talk about the Bible and stuff, it becomes so challenging. And for me, myself, you know, preach on a train. Uh, my passion is to preach. I, I love lifting up Jesus. But when you find yourself at, at work, at, like my, myself at, in a call center, most of the people is secular. So uh, for me from, to, to humble myself, um, it's definitely me. Putting Jesus in my in, in, in definitely in my heart every day, uh, because I can tell you this: it's not easy. Uh, it might so, it might be easy for someone that's sitting and you know say no, but it won't be difficult because every day we are faced with temptation, we are faced with with challenges, and um, so so I will say that from Monday to Friday, coming in the morning, um, the the way that I would like to 
present crisis actually like like managers read the question humbling myself in such a point that even and this might maybe don't it's maybe not going to sound right but even what i eat we're talking about humbling yourself it's what i eat as well because last week i was eating something someone just came to me and they made and they comment on it he said wow that's very healthy i had to humble myself <laughs> Because I'm a person that likes to eat uh, chocolates, and <laughs> but I had to humble myself in any every way that you can possibly to glorify Christ. So I will say it is a challenge at work, but um, I'll definitely get there by God's grace. Um, I love what what Brother Tyron was saying about even what he eats, because many times we think humbling ourselves means we must be the timid, scared, tiptoeing people mm. who who go through life walking on eggshells. But the, the, the fact is that um, when we, if we go back to our lesson study, it, we spe it speaks about um, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, humbling himself and coming and taking on the form of a man. And, and there, there's no tiptoeing on eggshells, you know. Um, mm. And so I saw, I, I, I have the Facebook open here, and so I see a few people watching. And so I'd like you, this is actually a personal question as well. It's looking at you in your personal life, you know, yeah. because I can answer this question for me. And I can tell you that for me, like, like Brother Tyron was saying, working with um, church people makes it a lot easier um, to, to humble yourself, to, 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 to be Christ-like, to turn the other cheek, to walk away, to apologize when you are wrong. Um, all of these things are instances that allow us to humble ourselves. And they're easy when we're working with others who are um, of the same belief as we are. But when, uh, and this is where I believe we need to be going, is back um, to the world because um, Jesus sends his disciples out and he, say, he sends them out first to Jerusalem and then to Judea and then to the ends of the earth. And, and we need to be going mm -hmm. that far to the ends of the earth, to those who don't believe. And that's where we need to be humbling ourselves. That's where we need to be showing Christ's character in our everyday lives when, when I'm driving and the taxi driver cuts me off um, and, and hand signs want to go flying out the window. Um, that is the time where I need to be humbling myself. When <coughs> I see someone in need and i know i have the capacity to help but it's a little bit um, uncomfortable for me to help that's where i need to be humbling mm -hmm. myself and and so um maybe in the comments uh, on facebook or uh, and so on we can also have that discussion of where we can humble ourselves and and mm -hmm. reach out to others and reflect christ to others by humbling ourselves amen I mean, thank you so much for that. Usually I'm on Facebook as well, but unfortunately my, my laptop sound is a bit bad. So I'm live from my, from my cell phone. Um, otherwise I would have, I would have checked the comments and, and um, welcome everyone uh, that, that that's watching, but you know, another good example of humbling yourself. And this is for me personally um, is especially in a church environment. And this is bringing it home now is that many times you find out that uh, we have the tendency to, to, to if you are wrong, this is the tendency that we that we, that we have. Um, if you are wrong, you need to come to me. Yeah. You need to apologize to me because you are the one in wrong. And I think humbling yourself is yeah. even if you uh, uh, did nothing wrong, even if you did nothing uh, in an offensive way that it might be according to your perspective. It's also good to go to the brother and sister and say, "Hey, I don't know what I've done." I see you angry at me. I see you don't greet me, but I came, I'm here to apologize. You know, sometimes, mm -hmm. or if it's a, a situation where someone did you wrong, and this yeah. happens quite regularly in, 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 in our church, and we, we tend to go to, to, to a church building to worship, but yet we have conflict among, among ourselves. And it's important, even if you write, or even if, yeah, even if you write, even if you did nothing wrong, to go to the person to humble yourself just to reconcile and to know that you did your part. Um, mm -hmm. For me personally, uh, people say that I'm very argumentative, uh, which is true to a certain extent here. Yeah. <laughs> and humbling myself would be to lose the argument, but win a soul. And I think sometimes we are so, uh, 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 um, as, we, as we call it in the Cape Flats, opet. we are so accustomed to <laughs> wanting to win the argument, even if it's a doctrine-based argument, and mm. push the person away 
instead of yeah. losing the argument, but yet winning, winning, winning the soul. I if think. I can, if I can, if, yes, please, Pastor. Please do. Please. If do. I can interrupt you, these are um, not just your words. Jesus Christ Himself, in Matthew chapter five, verse twenty-three and twenty-four, He says, "If you are offering your gift." at the altar and remember your brother has something against you which means you are not the one who's having issue your brother is having issue it says in verse 24 leave your gift before the altar and go first be reconciled to your brother then come and offer your gift and so if you are even worshiping and while worshiping you remember that someone else has something against you you are called to leave you are called to go and reconcile to that person hmm. interesting thank you thank you so much and that is the humbling part of it all eh? <laughs> that is the humbling part of it all um is there any final thoughts as we conclude we're going to ask uh, brother brother tp to give his final thought on this lesson study then pastor and if you don't pass if you can, could please close fast in prayer as well if i can just wrap up everything that we spoke about and my final thoughts everybody is listening and to to us for this week um you know we have a crazy crazy 2020 with this uh covid um and it's just going to get you know it's going to get challenging um but i want to just remind you that god loves us so we look if we look in the garden of eden god's plan and his desire was always for us to live forever but even though sin into the world Adam disobeyed. Um, it was God that was always looking after, um, looking for man. It is never humanity that looks for God. I just want to read your statement. It says the Spirit is constantly seeking to draw the attention of men to the great offering that was made on the cross of Calvary. So, what is the Holy Spirit's job? Is to point us to the cross, and that is our only hope that Jesus Christ can save us. Amen. Um, in closing, if we look at this again, and we just reminded, we are looking at being educated, and we're looking at not just being educated for this world, but being educated for heaven, and here we look at Jesus Christ as our master teacher, and if we are going to learn from Jesus Christ now, we need to be studying his life, it's through Jesus' life that we see that love that, that Brother Tyron just spoke about, that love of God, we see it through Jesus Christ, we need to be spending time in the word of God, we need to be spending time studying, learning who Jesus Christ is, what that character is, so that we can take on that impression in our lives, mm. so that we can live it out, because then we, as teachers of others, as leaders of others, um, everyone is a leader, someone is following you, everyone is a leader in some respect, and so in, in order to make sure that we are teaching those following us um, about Jesus correctly, we need to be following correctly, which means we need to be understanding who he is correctly. Mm. Let's bow our heads Amen. in prayer. <clears throat> Dear Lord, we thank you for these lessons. We thank you um, for these lessons that can lead us into a deeper understanding of who you are and because of that of who you want us to be. Dear Lord, as we close off now and as we go through the further hours of this evening, I pray that you are with us. I pray that as these words and these verses ring in our ears, that they lead us back to your word, that they lead us to study that they lead us to want to develop a deeper connection, a deeper understanding of who you are, that they lead us into a deeper, true education that will prepare us for your second coming. Please help us to share these messages with others, but not just these messages. Help us to live it, to live this life of <clears throat> reconciliation, to live a life that emulates and imitates you as our master teacher. Be with us now in Jesus' name, my prayer. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, uh, panel. I was very blessed this evening having a year. Thanks for those that are watching from near and far. May God bless you from the top of your head to the sole of your feet and have a <laughs> blessed week further. Goodbye. Amen. Thanks, Kassian. See you guys. See you guys. Thanks, Pastor. Thanks, Tyron, man. Cheers. Thanks, Thanks, guys. Bless, uh, this guys. was good. Let me log out, Manny. Oh, yeah. Ha, ha, ha.